Why have you forsaken me? When I read those words, most of us will think immediately to the cross, right? It's the words that Jesus uttered on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And, and if you break down the concept, if you, if you break down what he's saying here, it seems as though he is saying, God, why would you let me go through this? Or why would you abandon me? Why have you left me? Why, have you, why, why haven't you been here kind of thing, right? And, and, and I'm going to hopefully reframe that a little bit for you. But before I do that, I want to talk about you. How many times in your life have you felt this phrase? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And, and this phrase comes to us because we go through some stuff. We endure some things. Like we live in this life in a way that just doesn't seem sometimes like it should be as it is. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We lose loved ones, or we lose a job, or we lose our house, or we lose everything that we thought we, that we were supposed to have. Things don't work out the way they were supposed to. We're put in a position we didn't expect to be. We, we're hurt by somebody that we love deeply. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And I want you to listen to the psalmist in the 13th Psalm, and I, and I want to I want you to know, I want to know, do you feel these words? Have you ever felt these words? How long, Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and day after day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? Look on me and answer, Lord, my God. Give light to my eyes, or I will sleep in death. This is one of those psalms, right? That if you're, if, you're, if you're studying the Bible and you're just reading through the psalms and you read Psalms chapter 1 and it's in your, it, your, your word I delight. I, I, he, he speaks in a way, yea, though I walk in the shadow of the valley of death, I will fear no evil. You know, these kind of things we love to read. We love to read it because it's encouraging. But you have to understand, the psalmist many times goes into this place where he's asking the question, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And I think sometimes we're afraid to ask that question. We're afraid to cry out to God and say, how long, Lord? Will you forget me forever? And the truth is, that what happens to us is we hide our story from everyone. We hide our wounds from everyone, even God himself. We don't want people to know that we feel sometimes abandoned. We don't want people to know that we feel hurt and rejected. We, don't, we certainly don't want God to know that sometimes we feel like he's just not there. How long, Lord? And I love that about the psalmist. Is, is he, lets, he lets God in on all of it. He, he invites God in on all of his struggles. And if you read through the psalms, you'll find multiple times where he's saying, I don't understand what's happening. And he invites God into his wounds. And he invites God into his pain. He invites God into his struggles. When I was 18, maybe I was 19, uh, I hadn't seen my dad in about three years, I think. I went all the way through high school. My dad lived in Alabama. I lived in, in Senton, Texas, and I played high school football. And I'm going to be honest with you. Every game I played, I played because I wanted him to see my name in the paper. I wanted him to know that I succeeded. I wanted him to know I was good. And my name did go in the paper. And, and I, I wanted the phone call on the Saturday morning that said, hey, I'm proud of you, son. I wanted that so desperately. I didn't want to admit that to myself, but I knew deep down that was happening in me. And so I'm 19 years old, and my dad has come to town to watch my sister's graduation. And I go visit him. 
And then he's in a hotel room in Odom, Texas, which means it's just a hotel. <laughs> if you know anything about Odom, Texas. And you pull up, it's one of those motels, you know, you pull up right in front of the door and you park and I put my, my truck that I bought with my own money in park and I bring that up because that was one of the things I wanted my dad to see is I did this. And I really wanted to say without you, but also I wanted him to say I'm proud of you. So it was kind of this torn feeling. And so I went and knocked on the door and I'm, I'm this extremely um, grown up man now. And I knock on the door and he swings, no, he doesn't. He opens the door with the chain latched so he has this much room and he screams out the door, some curse words I won't repeat. And then he says, as far as I'm concerned, I don't have a son. The man I had been playing football for for four years, trying to get his approval, wanting to hear the words, I'm proud of you. The first time I see him, after all that time, I hear, I don't even have a son as far as I'm concerned. I broke that day. I didn't even know it. You see, because what I did is I steeled myself. And I said these words to myself, I will never let anyone hurt me like this again. And I shut me off. I think some of you have already done that too, right? I just shut off all of it. I'm not going to let anybody do this to me again. I didn't cry out to God. I didn't ask God why. I didn't cry out and beg for some sort of resolution to this problem. I just shut down. And I hid my wounds and my story from everyone. I remember going back to the family because we're having this graduation party. I have family from Florida. I have family from, from all over the country who came and they knew I went to see my dad. And they go, how'd it go? And I was like, meh. He's still the same old man he's always been. And I just brushed it off as if it didn't hurt. But I never took it to God. I never went to him and asked him to, in, to become a part of this. I never really thought about the end of the story. But do you know where the phrase Jesus utters, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me, comes from? It comes from a psalm. It's a song, actually. And so you ask yourself, why is Jesus singing this song in this moment? Why is Jesus singing the my God, my God, why have you forsaken me song in this moment? And I think the answer is easier than you might believe. The answer doesn't come from this verse. The answer comes from the end of this. And so I want to read this song, this psalm to you. And I want you to listen carefully. The psalmist says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from my cries of anguish? My God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer. By night, but I find no rest. Yet you are enthroned as the Holy One. You are the one Israel praises. In you, our ancestors put their trust. They trusted and you delivered them. To you they cried out and were saved. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by everyone, despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They hurl insults, shaking their head. He trusts in the Lord, they say. Let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him since he delights in him. Yet you brought me out of the womb. You made me trust in you even at my mother's breast. From birth, I was cast on you. From my mother's womb, you have been my God. Do not be far from me, for trouble is near and there is no one to help. Many bulls surround me, strong bulls of Bashan encircle me. Roaring lions that tear their prey open their mouths wide against me. I am poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. My heart has turned to wax. It has melted within me. My mouth is dried up like a potsherd and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You lay me in the dust of, the, of death. Dogs surround me, a pack of villains encircle me. They pierce my hands and my feet. All my bones are on display. People stare and gloat over me. They divide my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. But you, Lord, 
Do not be far from me. You are my strength. Come quickly to help me. Deliver me from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dogs. Rescue me from the mouth of the lions. Save me from the horns of the wild oxen. I will declare your name to my people. In the assembly, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants, Jacob, honor him. Revere him, all you descendants of Israel. For he has not despised or scorned the suffering of the afflicted one. He has not hidden his face from him, but has listened to his cry from help. From you comes the theme of my praise in the great assembly. Therefore, those who fear you, I will fulfill my vows. The poor will eat and be satisfied. Those who seek the Lord will praise him. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations will bow down before him. For dominion belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. All the rich of the earth will feast and worship. All who go down to the dust will kneel before him. Those who cannot keep themselves alive, posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about him. They will proclaim his righteousness, declare to a people yet unborn, he has done it. You see, Jesus isn't saying, just my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He is declaring that God will and God has done it. You remember the next phrase as Jesus' lips? It is finished. You see, at one moment it looks like we're, look, we're, we're seeing a man in despair, and the next moment we see a man in victory. You see, I don't know where your story is, but you've all got one, I'm quite certain. You've all got that painful story of rejection or that painful story of harm or hurt or, or that painful experience of, of feeling like you've been betrayed. You've got the story. And you want to cry out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But if you'll stay the course, you'll end with, he has done it. He has fought the battle. He has declared. In this world caught between two trees, it's easy to get trapped in our wounds, to believe that God has abandoned us. It's easy to believe that we are all alone and that no one sees us, not even God himself. No one understands us, not even God himself. No one empathizes with us, not even God himself. And so we go within ourselves. And I'm going to tell you, in this world between two trees, the safest place you think you can be is within yourself. Bearing all your shame in yourself. Bearing all your hurt in yourself. Enduring it all alone. Never proclaiming. Putting on the smile for the world to see while inside you're hurting and wasting away. You're struggling with that addiction or you're struggling with that sin or you're struggling with that pain or you're struggling with that hurt and you just keep stuffing it down because no one will understand and God seemingly has forgotten you. Jesus is declaring on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But he's also declaring you has done it. Let me go back to my story. For many years, I kept my promise to myself. For many years, I was never going to be hurt like that again. I hate to tell you this, there's only one way you can assure yourself of not being hurt. Do you know what that way is? You don't ever offer yourself. You don't offer your love your affection, your tenderness. You don't ever make yourself vulnerable. And so when that happens, all those around you are then affected by the curse you're living in. Are you with me on this? And one day, talking to somebody that loved me and I loved, my eyes were open to this internal vow that I would never let anyone hurt me again. And I realized not only did I succeed in not allowing anyone to ever hurt me again, I succeeded in never loving again. 
And so I changed. I shifted. I gave it to God. I cried out. I sought peace. I sought, I realized that I serve a God who though my father says, as far as I'm concerned, I don't have a son. My God says, you are my child. And I began to love. And I hope you want to do that. And what's interesting about that is maybe your question is, okay, how do I get there? How do I begin this process? How do I, how do I open those wounds back up? Because that's what it feels like. It feels like we're tearing open something you've sealed shut. It feels like you're opening and exposing yourself to all the pain again, all, all the, all the uh, insecurity again, all the fear again. It feels like it's not a good idea. I need to just keep stuffing. Like, I've done a really good job. I've got it all covered up really nicely. It's all in this neat little boat. Every once in a while it rears its ugly head, but then I just throw some more stuff on top of it, and then we forget about it, and we move on, but we don't realize the ripple effect has been affecting people longer than you know for the thing that you're trying to hide. So what's the first step? I think the first thing in, in this whole series is We need to remember some things. We need to remember that we all long to be someone else. We've made a union with death, we've killed love, and we are often caught in our wounds. And the first step to transformation may surprise you. I want to read a verse that I'm sure you know, but it's in in Revelation chapter 3. And it says this, Here I am. This is Jesus talking. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. Have you heard that verse before? You've probably heard sermons about it. It's like God is knocking on the door of your heart, right? And, 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 he, and he wants you to invite him in. It's an evangelistic sermon almost always. But the interesting thing is, is it's not intended to be an evangelistic sermon. It's intended to be a sermon to his believers. It's it's a message to you and me. Here, I stand at the door and knock. And if you'll open it up, I'll come in and I'll eat with you. I'll dine with you. In other words, I will fellowship with you. Here, I stand at the door and knock. Why is the God of all the universe, the one who can speak into existence, the very life that you live, the breath that you breathe, the, the, the eyes that you see with, why is he knocking? Sometimes I wish he wouldn't knock. Amen? Sometimes I wish he'd bring the battering ram and just kick the door down and get in there. But he doesn't. He just knocks. And it's funny because I've heard the knocking throughout my life. You have too. I've heard the knocking of my conscience crying out. I've heard the knocking of my, of my heart spilling out. I've heard the knocking of me wanting to finally let him in and give my life to him wholly, completely. I've heard the knocking. But I'm scared to open the door a lot of times. What happens if I open the door? <laughs> I don't see it the way this says it, right? I'm going to come in and eat with him. And he with me. It'll be a grand old time. Yeah, but when I open that door, you're going to see that I didn't put the clothes away. Like the mess is in the kitchen. I hadn't taken out the trash in months. When I open that door, you're probably going to know because you're God, right? You're not going to knock on the closet door. You're just going to open and be like, this is where all your mess is. He wants to eat with me. And I'm thinking he's going to walk in and look at, oh my. This is how you live. How do I get from where I'm at to where he's taking me? He's knocking on the door to come eat with me. He's not come knocking on the door so he can come judge me. He's not knocking on the door so he can identify all the flaws and faults that I have, although that's what I feel. He's knocking on the door. And all I have to do is grant him permission to enter. All I have to do is give him permission. You see, the spirit world works on a permission basis. 
The spirit world does not invade. He's invited. Spirit world knocks, not knocks down the door. And so this is true, though. This is not just true of the spirit world, the good side. It's also true of the negative things. It has to have permission. Every choice we make, we become someone different. Did you know that? Have you ever thought about that? You are the sum of your choices. Every choice we make affects us. It's, they call it in, 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 in layman's terms, the butterfly effect, right? There's this, there's this choice we make and then it just ripples out. Every choice. That's why scripture uses terms like this. Whatever you do in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord. Because every choice makes us someone different. We're permitting something into our lives when we make choices that are in conflict with who we are. We're permitting this new thing. How many of you remember the first time you lied? Now, I mean, intentionally lied, not the childhood lies where you don't really know the truth, so you just tell them whatever. I'm talking about when you, that moment, I remember, I remember it when I was a kid, when I, when I decided to lie. I had broken this picture of my mom's and it was her great her mom's and my mom loved this picture and I had broken it and I just looked at it and it's all its shattered pieces and I thought hmm how am I gonna handle this brilliant idea I will tell her I don't know What happened to my vase? I don't know. Did you break it? Mm -mm. <laughs> and then you do the real good thing. You're like, I bet it was the dog. <laughs> I made a conscious decision to lie that day. And what's interesting about it is I got away with it for a long time. I thought. But I realized, I oh, God, I didn't get in trouble. I'm golden. What I did is I permitted into my life lying. And now the next time, guess what was easier to do? In fact, not only was it easier to do, I was compelled to do it. It wasn't even, it didn't even feel like a choice as much anymore. It was like, well, you know how to get out of this one. You lie. And then lying becomes everything else. And you're like, yeah, that's not how it works. Oh, that's exactly how it works. In fact, the scripture, or the, there's a song that, that is sung that is all about the idea that our sin and death is all about a slow fade. It doesn't happen overnight. It happens with little bitty decisions that become bigger decisions, that become easier. Sin is permission for death to be a part of my life. And every sin we have ever entered and partaken in started small. We gave in just a little bit, and then we gave in some more. So who will you become if you choose? Who will you become if you choose? Jesus says, behold, I stand at the door and I knock. And he says, and if you invite me in, I'll come in and I'll eat with you. And I, that takes me to communion. We talked about just a minute ago. Scripture says, while they were eating... Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink from it, all of you. This is the blood of my covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. You ever heard the phrase, you are what you eat? You know what that means? It, it, it literally means the things you choose to ingest will become a reflection of you. And that's just not what you eat, right? It's who you invite into your life. It's what you invite into your life. Everything, the, the door is constantly being knocked on. Jesus is knocking. And so is sin knocking at your door. So are bad choices. 
there was a, a documentary, A Man Ate McDonald's for like three months or something. Have y'all seen this documentary? And he documented how his body changed, how his face changed, how everything changed. Just so you know, you might have a hard time eating McDonald's after you watch that. It wasn't good. You are what you eat. You, you become what you allow yourself to ingest, to take in. Jesus says, come unto me, take, eat, this is my body. Do you realize what's in there? It's, a, it's an invitation to partake. It's not a demand to take. Does that make sense? It's an invitation by Jesus to eat his flesh, drink his blood, and become, guess what? Him. Like him. But in order to do that, we have to constantly and consistently empty ourselves of ourselves, denying ourselves. Because the truth of the matter is our flesh wants to be fed. It wants to be fed bad. And it's yearning. And it's loud. And it's fun. Until it's not. It's exciting. It's interesting. It's unique. And so... If we allow that flesh to reign, we will eat of the very things that will destroy us. How many of you know, be honest, that vegetables are better than pizza for you? How many of you know that pizza tastes better than vegetables? (laughs) Right? But the truth is, if you start being intentional about your choices of the food you make, you will intentionally receive the results you're seeking. If you're intentional about it, if you just go on a seafood diet, if you see it, eat it. If you go on a seafood diet, you're going to see some things there too. To open the door and let Jesus into our lives means that we have to empty ourselves of ourselves. And if we don't empty ourselves of ourselves, we'll never want to open the door. And I want you to understand the first step to becoming, to transforming, to becoming the you that you so desperately want to be is permission. You got to open the door. And let him come in and eat with you. Oh yeah, he's going to see the dirty clothes on the floor. He's going to see the table hasn't been cleaned off or wiped off. He's going to see the fact that you don't take out the trash or dust the shelves. He's going to see all of it. You know what's crazy about that though? Here's what he says. Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden. All you who are weary and overburdened. Listen to this next part. And I will give you not judgment, not condemnation, not assaulting you, I will give you rest. And I'll put a new burden on you that's light and easy. But the first step is you got to invite him in. And the next step is let him do what he does because he does it better than you do. He has achieved this. And you ought to welcome him. Welcome him into those wounds. Welcome him into all that dirty Welcome him into all of those struggles. Welcome him into all the insecurities. Welcome him into you. Oh, you're going to be exposed. But the light dispels the darkness, including that dark gloominess that you've been assaulted by. Do you want this? Would you like to have a meal with Jesus? Would you like for him to come into your home and dine with you, and break bread with you. Oh, you'd never had a better house guest. And I promise you, you won't leave the same. Because he's the transformer. He brings transformation, and hope, and promises, and provisions. I'm going to get a little personal but I want you to think for just a second. Is my belief, because I talk to a lot of people and I'm very interested in your life, most of us have that something, right? We have that closet. 
We have that hurt. We have that wound. We have that internal vow. We have that something that we have closed off to everyone, especially God. The only time we bring it out is when we need the power to, 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 to be angry or to somehow respond or to protect ourselves. That's the only time that door gets open. We don't tell anybody why the door's open. We're just always, that's our source of strength to protect ourselves. Here's the thing I want you to understand. When you let Jesus in there, he'll redeem even that for you. And the rest of my story goes like this. I raised three awesome kids and I am their dad and they are my children. God redeemed from a broken home the opportunity for me to be the dad I never got. But I was on a journey of not being that dad because of my internal vow. Because what children need more than anything is they need to know that you love them earnestly. And if my internal vow says I'm not going to let anybody hurt me, that included my kids. So tearing down that wall allowed me to enter my kids' lives in ways I would have never done if I had not torn down those walls and let God into that area of my life. I promise you, your addictions, your, your, your sin, your fears, your failures, all those things are things that God can take and redeem and work them out for the good if you'll just let him in. Open the door. He's knocking. Will you pray with me? Father God, I am so very grateful to you that though I never got the dad I wanted, I got to be the dad I wanted. I didn't do it perfect, but I thank you so much that you gave me the opportunity to father and raise and mentor three awesome kids and now some awesome in-laws. And I just pray, Father, that I never stop inviting you into the dark places. I never stop inviting you into the wounds and the hurt and into my story. That I continue to eat with you and dine with you and break bread with you and, and allow you to see all of the ugly because you make everything beautiful. And I pray over every person in this room that today be the day that they open up their door and allow you into the deepest places to eat with you and to receive what you're offering. Father, I pray that today be a day of healing and of overcoming, of victory, and all of us being more than conquerors over marriages, over hearts, over lives, over insecurities, all of those things, Father. I pray that you set us free and that we open the door so that you can pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and sing together.